Right resolve. The definition. And what is right resolve? Being resolved on renunciation, on freedom from ill will, on harmlessness, this is called right resolve. SN 45.8 Cultivating skillful ways of thought. And how is one made pure in three ways by mental action? There is the case where a certain person is not covetous. He does not covet the belongings of others, thinking, oh, that what belongs to others would be mine. He bears no ill will and is not corrupt in the resolves of his heart. He thinks, may these beings be free from animosity, free from oppression, free from trouble, and may they look after themselves with ease. He has right view and is not warped in the way he sees things, there is what is given, what is offered, what is sacrificed. There are fruits and results of good and bad actions. There is this world and the next world. There is mother and father. There are spontaneously reborn beings, there are Brahmins and contemplatives who, faring rightly and practicing rightly, proclaim this world and the next after having directly known and realized it for themselves. This is how one is made pure in three ways by mental action. AN 10.176 Its relation to the other factors of the path. And how is right view the forerunner? One discerns wrong resolve as wrong resolve, and right resolve as right resolve. And what is wrong resolve? Being resolved on sensuality, on ill will, on harmfulness. This is wrong resolve. One tries to abandon wrong resolve and to enter into right resolve, this is one's right effort. One is mindful to abandon wrong resolve and to enter and remain in right resolve, this is one's right mindfulness. Thus these three qualities, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness, run and circle around right resolve. MN 117 Dividing one's thinking into two sorts. The blessed one said, monks, before my self-awakening, when I was still just an unawakened bodhisattva, the thought occurred to me, why don't I keep dividing my thinking into two sorts? So I made thinking imbued with sensuality, thinking imbued with ill will, and thinking imbued with harmfulness one sort, and thinking imbued with renunciation, thinking imbued with non-ill will, and thinking imbued with harmlessness another sort. And as I remained thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, thinking imbued with sensuality arose in me. I discern that thinking imbued with sensuality has arisen in me, and that leads to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It obstructs discernment, promotes vexation, and does not lead to unbinding. As I noticed that it leads to my own affliction, it subsided. As I noticed that it leads to the affliction of others. To the affliction of both. It obstructs discernment, promotes vexation, and does not lead to unbinding, it subsided. Whenever thinking imbued with sensuality had arisen, I simply abandoned it, destroyed it, dispelled it, wiped it out of existence. And as I remained thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, thinking imbued with ill will arose in me. I discern that thinking imbued with ill will has arisen in me, and that leads to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It obstructs discernment, promotes vexation, and does not lead to unbinding. As I noticed that it leads to my own affliction, it subsided. As I noticed that it leads to the affliction of others. To the affliction of both. It obstructs discernment, promotes vexation, and does not lead to unbinding, it subsided. Whenever thinking imbued with ill will had arisen, I simply abandoned it, destroyed it, dispelled it, wiped it out of existence. MN 19 Reflecting on one's actions Whenever you want to perform a bodily act, you should reflect on it, this bodily act I want to perform, would it lead to self-affliction, to the affliction of others, or to both? Is it an unskillful bodily act, with painful consequences, painful results? If, on reflection, you know that it would lead to self-affliction, to the affliction of others, or to both, it would be an unskillful bodily act with painful consequences, painful results, then any bodily act of that sort is absolutely unfit for you to do. But if on reflection you know that it would not cause affliction, it would be a skillful bodily action with happy consequences, happy results, then any bodily act of that sort is fit for you to do. While you are performing a bodily act, you should reflect on it, this bodily act I am doing, 
is it leading to self-affliction, to the affliction of others, or to both? Is it an unskillful bodily act, with painful consequences, painful results? If, on reflection, you know that it is leading to self-affliction, to affliction of others, or both, you should give it up. But if on reflection you know that it is not, you may continue with it. Having performed a bodily act, you should reflect on it. If, on reflection, you know that it led to self-affliction, to the affliction of others, or to both, it was an unskillful bodily act with painful consequences, painful results, then you should confess it, reveal it, lay it open to the teacher or to a knowledgeable companion in the holy life. Having confessed it, you should exercise restraint in the future. But if on reflection you know that it did not lead to affliction, it was a skillful bodily action with happy consequences, happy results, then you should stay mentally refreshed and joyful, training day and night in skillful mental qualities. Similarly for verbal and mental acts. Therefore, Rahula, you should train yourself, I will purify my bodily acts through repeated reflection. I will purify my verbal acts through repeated reflection. I will purify my mental acts through repeated reflection. That is how you should train yourself. MN 61 Loving Kindness Here, Bicchus, a certain person abides with his heart imbued with loving kindness extending over one quarter, likewise the second quarter, likewise the third quarter, likewise the fourth quarter, and so above, below, around, and everywhere, and to all as to himself, he abides with his heart abundant, exalted, measureless in loving kindness, without hostility or ill will, extending over the all encompassing world. AN 4.125 for oneself, for others. Of two people who practice the Dhamma in line with the Dhamma, having a sense of Dhamma, having a sense of meaning, one who practices for both his own benefit and that of others, and one who practices for his own benefit but not that of others, the one who practices for his own benefit but not that of others is to be criticized for that reason, the one who practices for both his own benefit and that of others is, for that reason, to be praised. AN 7.64